questions, so I'm just going to go through them quickly. Um, if I can move. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, yeah, so where to start? Um, you know, observing what you have is really the most important thing. Um, what existing plants do you have? Um, how many, what layers do you have in the landscape structure? Um, how much light, your soil type, pH, nutrients, biology, moisture, um, that's the, the slope and topography of your of your yard, um, salt spray areas, um, how big it is, you know, if you have a quarter acre versus 40 acres, it's going to be different, um, and utilities above and below ground. Um, also, I wanted to put in a picture of trout lily because it's blooming now. Um, uh, so also to watch out for uh, or keep an eye out for native volunteer plants that you have. Um, uh, yeah, these are just a few that uh, are commonly found in people's yards. Um, you know, common milkweed, wild strawberry, New England aster, um, sensitive fern in wet area, wetter areas. Um, Daisy fleabane is a native annual, uh, goldenrod, and uh, the blue vervain. Um, other thing you also might get, um, you know, shrub and uh, tree and shrub seedlings that come in, especially some birds. Um, where to start is um, deciding which habit, which of the habitat types you want to grow and where in your yard. Um, you know, if you want to have um, organic or a low mow lawn in some places, um, where you want meadow or a wetland garden or a rain garden, um, which is different from a wetland garden, just in that. Um, you know, wetland gardens are places that are just wet in the yard um, naturally. Um, and a rain garden is, um, you know, a place that's normally dry, but that you're making wet um, to, you know, slow um, roof runoff and things like that. Um, and hedgerows and shrublands and forests. Um, so, and it's okay to start small. Um, just you can learn from your mistakes and, um, you know, try to <laughs> enjoy it without getting overwhelmed. Um, and then getting in, getting inspired, but from books, um, local parks, natural areas, and the countryside. This is um, just the landscape structure that you um, that you're wanting to create in your yard. Um, it's good to have a, a mix in your yard. Um, again, it depends a little bit on the scale. Um, you know, if you only have a quarter acre, there's only so much space you have. Um, but um, yep, so canopy trees, understory trees. Um, like this dogwood in this picture, um, then shrubs and vines and uh, perennials and ground covers. Um, so you're going to use these um, different, um, you know, the different heights of plants in the landscape to create paths and outdoor rooms. Um, and then there's also, um, you know, you can use a native hedgerow for privacy um, if you have a space for it. And um, they, a native hedgerow supports eight times as many birds as a non-native hedgerow. Um, just the basics of starting a garden plan. Um, having a property survey is great, but not necessary. Um, you can start with a Google Maps aerial, and then just get um, the general layout and scale of the area is helpful um, for planning. Um, and start thinking about what plants you want to keep and what plants you want to remove. Um, uh, when removing invasives, it's good to remember um, you want to start by keeping the good areas good, and then move to the more difficult areas. Um, just because you can, you know, it can take a very, it can be really hard to remove um, invasive. So, um, so, you know, if it takes a long time in one area, you don't want to make it lose other areas while you're working on that. Um, and the plant spacing, um, it's not really, it's not the conventional plant spacing of like two foot on center for perennials. Um, you want them to, you want all the layers to knit together, even in the perennial and ground layer. Um, like in this picture, you can see white wood aster is flowering, and there's also the um, seed heads of um, forming Virgi uh, Virginia anemone. But then in this area, there's also wild strawberry and uh, trout lily and Dutchman's breeches, which are two spring ephemerals. Um, and then yellow wood sorrel is a little native annual that'll grow um, in open spaces too. Also, you want to remember to put plants of similar aggressiveness together. Um, you don't want, you know, to plant a really aggressive plant next to really, um, you know, less aggressive plants. Oh, my like God. Earth, but... um, so, yeah, the design layout, uh, this is, again, just a quick reminder, um, cues to care to show that, um, you know, because it's, um, 
landscaping with native plants is not uh, is pretty different from most conventional landscaping. So just to show, you know, little cues to care to show that um, this is deliberate and that it's being cared for. Um, and here are some design resources from Wild Ones on um, native garden designs. Um, they have some great new example garden designs from cities in a bunch of different areas in the United States. Um, and they're adding videos too of, um, of the designers talking about each of these. So there's another good resource. Um, and then just a little bit on the design style of your landscape. Um, naturalistic is of course um, a great <laughs> um, style to go with. Um, that's what, although you know, a lot of um, landscaping native plants is, which is great. Um, but you can also have more formal designs or more formal design elements um, in your landscape. Um, just, you know, to, um, if there's certain areas that are more, that are viewed more often or that you'd like to see something a little bit different, that's okay to do too. Um, the key is just to keep the ecological processes going um, and to not use synthetic chemicals and not need too much energy um, for maintenance. Um, or yet to maintain the area and not to have to put too much work into it for you to. Um, and yeah, you can just pick if you want to just like, like the front walk to your house or just a certain place that you'd like to do it or just adding an element somewhere um, can be a good choice, um, but not, not necessary, but an, an option. Um, but, and you're going to want to be thinking about um, when you're laying out the design, the spaces and structure um, and creating outdoor rooms, and whether spaces feel enclosed or open, and if there are key views that you want to show or hide. Um, this is just a few other different styles that um, you know you can do with native plants. Um, obviously, this is um, if you <laughs> uh, this is sort of a, based on a um, parterre garden, which is obviously um, to keep it in these exact lines would be a lot of effort, but uh, or you know a lot more effort than the more naturalistic style. But you know if there's certain places. Um, you want to add more structure, sort of like in this sketch, um, you know, then you, to add a little bit more formality in your garden, you can do that too. Um, and then this is just a Japanese garden from Seattle um, on, on the left. Um, not obviously uh, like Japanese maples are a big, are a big part of those, but, um, you know, you can have sort of similar elements or similar design style from these using native plants. Um, you know, um, things like flowering dogwood that have sort of that and pagoda dogwood that have that sort of similar aesthetic you can use. Um, yep, so ways to remove lawn. Um, you can dig out turf with a flat shovel is um, how I do it a lot, especially um, for smaller areas. Um, you can cut an edge, usually cut an edge around the area with the shovel first and then, um, and if you're doing curved areas, you can um, use a hose to help lay out the lines. Um, so then while you're digging out, you slice, um, you cut the edge and then you slice uh, just a few inches below ground, below the bottom of the grass roots. Um, so it comes out sort of like a mat. And then you can knock off the loose soil to keep it in place so you're not losing, um, you know, your organic matter as much. Um, and then if you do this, you can plant and mulch the area immediately. Um, there is a sod cutting machine you can use for large areas. Um, and then sheet composting is another method. Uh, this is sort of a, I don't actually have that many pictures of it. So this is kind of a small, <laughs> small edge example, obviously. Um, so sheet composting is either you put down a layer of cardboard or several layers of newspaper with three to four uh, inches of mulch on top. Um, and then you sort of let that decompose underneath. Um, usually give it several months. Um, I'll usually do it in the, you know, uh, spring or summer and then plant in the fall or put it down in the fall and then plant in the spring. Um, yep, so that, um, that, you know, it takes, you can't plant immediately into that usually. And um, also, um, oh, it increases the height of your, of the ground a little bit. Um, you know, when you dig out the soil, it's a little bit lower and then you do this, so it's a little bit higher. Um, not very much, but, you know, anyway, just a little bit. <laughs> um, another method, uh, this organic, is to smother it with uh, plastic. Um, which you'd put that down, I think, for several months too, and then hold it down with rocks or brick. Um, I don't, I'm not like, you know, I'm not sure that that's my preferred method just because, um, you know, plastic is still made with um, fossil fuels, but, uh, but it is better than, I think, using chemicals still, especially if it's a larger area. It's, um, 
you know, can be helpful. Um, and just a little bit on lawns, um, you want to reduce your lawn size to only what's necessary for walking in play areas, ideally. Um, it can take some time to do this, uh, so that's, that's okay, but um, for what lawn you do have, you can switch to organic lawn care um, so that you're not using synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. Um, you can also, in your lawn, uh, kind of just let the weeds grow in, um, and it's usually there are very few um, lawn weeds are invasive in natural areas, so they're not usually a problem anywhere else except uh, the lawn, which is sort of, um, you know, we sort of, just, sort of just made up those aesthetic values for that. So it's, I feel like, you know, having some flowers is kind of, is, um, you know, not a negative anyway. Um, Japanese siltgrass is one invasive plant um, that can come into natural areas um, and that I think can grow in lawn, but it's not, um, Anyway, so you'd, that one you would want to take care of or remove if it does come in. And, you know, dan, uh, weeds like dandelions and violets, which some violets are native, um, are also edible. So that's a good, you know, if you have um, if you have a salad growing in your lawn, I think that's pretty helpful. Um, and then clover also fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere, so it's adding nutrients to your soil. Um, and then a lomo lawn is just uh, a shorter, um, you can find seed mixes from different nurseries for this. And it's just um, it's just grass species that grow shorter and only get mowed like once or twice a year. Um, and then a lot of people, you know, have some invasive plants growing in their yard. They can either be ones that came in from the wild or ones that were planted, um, you know, on purpose uh, before we realized they were invasive. <laughs> um, so the key for this is don't buy more, even cultivars, which I think you can still find cultivars with things like barberry, but you really should not buy them because they don't really know that they're um, not going to make any seed. Um, anyway, yeah, so don't so don't buy more. Stop them from spreading. Um, some spread by seed and some more by rhizome. Um, and I think, uh, um, sorry, I'm trying to think of how. <laughs> um, Oh, Japanese knotweed, I think if you like cut the plant, any part that you cut can root also. So you want to be careful not to, you know, cut it and leave, um, leave the cuttings lying around because those can also root. Um, and then start removing and, re and replacing them with natives. Um, just again, root start with keeping the good areas, keeping the invasive series, the species out of the good areas. Uh, native alternatives to invasive, there's, um, you know, in Bradford pear is, uh, these are both flowering now, so it's sort of a good example, um, is a, was a pretty commonly planted plant um, that's definitely invasive. You can see it, um, you know, even just driving around, uh, you know, down the highway, you see areas where it's starting to come in into the wild, which is a problem, obviously. Um, so you, instead of this, you can, but I thought the, um, there was a stop sign right in front of it, which I thought was funny, but um uh, so instead of that, you can plant something like a native Amelanchier, um, which are service berry or June berry. Uh, they have a few different common names. Um, so this, um, they have some of them, some of the species are shorter and some are like a, are shorter and some can go 20 to 25 feet tall. So you just want to, um, you know, make sure you're getting the right one for your space. Um, but yeah, they're a beautiful native flowering tree or small tree. Um, Yep, that also has edible fruit. But you do see this along the highway too sometimes, so that's nice to see. But, uh, just a quick reminder that there are a lot of edible native plants, um, you know, that you can work into your landscape and that you're, that way you're, you know, supporting biodiversity and feeding yourself too. Um, just another reminder um, that you're, while you're picking plants, you're going to be thinking about succession through the seasons and the years. Um, the dominant plants will change over time. Um, and, you know, obviously what's flowering will change throughout the season. But, uh, and this is part of um, filling in all the niches to try to reduce weeds. Um, another one last reminder, uh, just from Doug Palmy's book, uh, that you want to, when you're picking your plants, they obviously have to be right for your soil and conditions, but you also want to try to um, supercharge the biodiversity by picking um, keystone plants to plant. Um, in your yard as much as you can to really support the most biodiversity, um, you know, that you can with your effort. Um, yeah, so now I'm just going to kind of go through um, an example garden plan and the different habitat types that you can be um, adding to your yard. Um, 
So yeah, this is sort of an example yard, uh, or this is an example yard. Um, it's a pr pretty typical of planting. There's a lot of some ornamental trees like crab apples and apple trees and magnolias, um, and some ornamental shrubs like hydrangea and rhododendrons, um, not the native ones. Um, there's also a, a hedge of border privet along the um, property with a neighbor, um, which north is actually to the um, uh, right on the screen on this plan. Um, so it's a little bit tilted, but um, yeah, so on the east side, there's a, a neighbor, and then there's uh, woods around the back on two sides. This is kind of um, the, uh, it's about an acre, so it's bigger than most residential properties, but um, certainly there are a lot of people with, um, you know, large, like 40 acre, or, you know, larger landscapes too. But um, anyway, the scale is just important for thinking about, um, you know, just how much you can do at, at one point. Um, so there's also the soil or the site. Um, you want to think about the topography. The general slope of the site is from, you know, the bottom right corner to the top left. So this is sort of a wetter area, especially in spring. Um, it is all heavy clay soil though, so it all gets pretty wet in the spring. Um, so that's just, you know, the soil type's important, obviously. Um, there's also a pretty large black walnut, um, which also impacts what you can plant in this area. Um, and there's some more black walnuts in the woods just over here. So that's just something to think about also when you're picking plants. Um, there's also some, there's a large um, thicket of red twig dogwood and silky dogwood over in this area, which is nice. Um, there's also over to the um, to the west of the site, there's um, an, an electric substation not too far away. So that's kind of a view you want to think about blocking um, as much as you can. Uh, there's also some existing uh, meadow plants that um, grew in wild. It was just an area of the vegetable garden that didn't get, um, you know, that didn't get plowed for a few years. So there's a lot of good native growing in there. Um, New England aster and a couple of goldenrods, um, a couple other asters too, and a milkweed, sensitive fern, uh, daisy bleeding, a native annual, and uh, blue eye grass. Um, yeah, so you want to think about what good stuff you have that you. Um, that you want to spread and what invasive stuff or what invasive and other plants you want to remove. Um, so this next slide is um, just, you know, starting to think about which plants you want to remove. Um, the privet hedge, obviously, that's, you know, clearly an invasive plant in this area. So that's a good one to try to remove as quickly as you can. Um, but, it, you know, yeah, as quickly as you can. Um, this vine also is a non-native kiwi vine, so which I think isn't, um, which can be invasive, but I don't think, it's not like obviously invasive here right now, but I think it's better to be cautious about things like that. Um, and then the dashed X's, the dashed lines are for plants to remove eventually, but may not, um, not initially. Um, there's these two, uh, there was a line of Norway maples along the driveway. Um, one of them, they all have girdling roots, so they are on their way out um, slowly, but uh, the this Norway maple was um, died first, so um, we just left the first about 10 feet um, and then cut the top off so that it wasn't a danger to anybody, but left the snag um, so that you can see a lot of wildlife uses it, especially woodpeckers. Um, and then we planted vines to grow up it, um, but I'll talk about that later. Um, yeah, so these nor two Norway maples will be removed eventually, but not right away. Um, you know, they're they're on the west side of the house, so they help to shade the house in um, in summer, in the afternoon, and the driveway also. So that um, is somewhat helpful, at least in the um, interim. Um, and then the foundation plantings they're on the front of the house are just used. Um, so those aren't uh, they're not invasive, but they're not native, so you're not really getting much ecological function out of them. So that's also another good one to remove eventually. Um, and this is the hybrid willow in the back. Um, that's not spreading, but, um, you know, would be good to remove eventually to get more function out of it. Yeah, so meadows um, are, you know, one of the earliest habitat types or earliest successional habitat types you're going to plant. Um, unless, you have an ex unless you have existing trees and shrubs, um, every type that you plant is going to start out as a meadow. Um, they usually grow in full sun to part sun, um, and they can grow in dry to wet soil. Um, so there's a big variation there. Um, they can grow from a few feet tall um, 
to eight feet tall. Um, so, so the short grass prairie and the um, tall grass prairie as examples, um, like big blue stem is a very tall um, native grass. Um, so and that typically meadows will have lots of showy flowers throughout the season, which is nice. Um, and then yeah, when you're starting to plant an area, it's important to clear the planting area thoroughly before you put in the new plants just so that um, you know, you're not getting a lot of weed, weed pressure right from when you start. Um, so yeah, these plants are um, Daisy Fleabane, that native annual, and uh, Slump Milkweed, uh, which with a little monarch caterpillar on there. <laughs> um, and then this is Brown Eyed Susan with a painted lady butterfly, I think. Um, and then this is Culver's Root, which has the beautiful tall white spikes in summer. Um, so that one, it does get, I think, like six feet tall, but you can obviously you can see through the top a lot. So it's not like um, giving you that enclosed feeling of some tall meadows. Um, and then this is uh, goldenrod, some goldenrod and um, New England aster in the fall. Um, ground coffers are important for all the habitat types. Um, they're a part of filling in, making sure all the niches are filled to help keep weeds out and to support biodiversity. Um, and uh, these have pretty showy flowers, but they're not, they don't, they don't all, and, um, and they're still, you know, really beneficial and having a lot of um, ecological functions, even though they're not that showy. And sometimes, um, you know, they can be pretty low to the ground, so they're not as visible as some of the taller perennials. Um, so this is um, Canada anemone, uh, which is very pretty, but <laughs> very aggressive. So you have to, um, you know, make sure it's a good spot for it. And you, um, it has enough, you know, space and get room to grow. Um, this is prairie smoke that, um, yeah, is, is very, um, is a nice ground cover for drier soil. Um, and this one below it is actually water avens, which they're in the same genus, but um, the water avens grows in wet soil. Um, uh, yeah, so they're both good ground covers. And this is Pacara aurea with the yellow flowers, um, golden groundsel, um, which is really, uh, it's a really tough. Um, native ground cover that is just like a workhorse if you just need a place to be covered um, and get some nice flowers. It's very helpful for that. Um, but it is pretty aggressive, so if you're not a lot of stuff is going to grow through grow with it. Um, yep, just something to think about. Um, and then wild ginger is a good shade ground cover too, um, with obviously a nice um, stir to the leaves, even though the flowers aren't that showy. But and ferns are also good too. For that. Um, yeah, so the wetland gardens, um, they're perfect in poorly drained areas, um, you know, the wet, if you have a wet section in your lawn that is hard to mow, this is a good place for that. Um, and it's good if you have heavy clay soil too, um, you can grow a lot of wetland plants. Um, and it's okay usually if the area dries out in this, like in the summer, if the area dries out, um, that's okay for a lot of wetland plants. Um, it doesn't have to be wet all the time, um, at least for a lot of species. There are um, Facultative wetland plants, which grow mostly in wetlands, but not only in wetlands, so they're the more flexible ones. Um, and then there are obligate wetland plants um, that usually grow on the edge of, um, you know, like a water body, so they need to be wet all the time, pretty much, to grow in the site. Um, so those might not be work in every um, seasonally wet area. Um, also, just if you're uh, working in a like a regulated wetland, you um, that's sort of uh, this is obviously for larger properties usually, um, but that can require a permit depending on what you're doing. So just, you know, be aware of that. Um, and uh, wetland gardens can also include trees and shrubs. Um, there's some great wetland trees like, um, uh, you know, black gum, I think, um, is uh, a nice native tree that can grow in wetlands sometimes. And um, like button bush is a nice uh, native wetland shrub. Yep, so in spring, they're pretty much going to start out, um, they're pretty much going to be a mud puddle, <laughs> um, which is totally fine for them. Um, in a few months, you'll have um, the irises blooming, uh, which are one of my favorite native flowers. Um, and it's pretty amazing, the difference in like a month and a half <laughs> um, is pretty cool. Um, and then this is, just, I don't have a lot of seed pictures in here, but this is the iris seed um, at the top here, and they're uh, you know, just when you're doing working with native plants, it's important to let the ecological process is happening, um, and especially letting things go to seed um, is important. Um, something, if there's something really aggressive, maybe you don't want to let it go to seed all the time, but 
for most things, it's good to let that happen. Um, and then this is how it could start out when you first plant it, um, just a cleared area with, um, you know, some small plants there. Um, it's typically how it'll start. And then, uh, you know, in a couple of years, you'll have um, larger, it'll be, um, you know, really thriving and look hopefully like this. Um, this one has some sneeze weed in it, uh, which doesn't cause allergies. Um, it's not, I don't know why it's called that, but anyway. Um, if this is red cardinal flower is nice, and there's some white turtle head here, which um, bumblebees really like. Um, and this blue lobelia, which some bumblebees also pollinate. Um, and then so there's some Virginia mountain mint in the back. Um, yep, so those are all good uh, wetland plants. Uh, and then swamp milkweed, which um, is obviously another host plant for the monarch uh, butterflies, and also you know is uh, good for all the pollin other pollinators too. Um, so just back to the landscape plan a little bit. Um, so yeah, this is sort of like once you've removed, um, you know, sort of your first uh, first uh, phase of um, plants that you want to remove from your yard, you can just start planting. It's basically, as far as sun and shade, it's basically based on your existing conditions, not like what it'll be event. You know, when the trees you plant are mature. Um, there's some in the front. There's some native perennials under these two crab apples in the front. Um, and then adding uh, these lighter green or brighter green uh, circles are trees and shrubs um, that I'm planting or that you're planting. And the darker areas of the dark green are like shade and wetland or woodland garden areas. Um, this is a wetland garden down in the low spot in the yard. Um, with a black gum, uh, Nissa sylvatica tree in it. Um, and then this is a witch hazel with some more, um, you know, black walnut tolerant woodland plants underneath. Um, here's a spice bush hedge and a winterberry hedge um, to try to block that view towards the um, substation um, that you don't really want to be seeing. Um, and there's some more uh, woodland plants, um, you know, woodland perennials underneath the existing woods on the edge of the site. Um, and then, yeah, you can see that uh, sort of throughout the site. And um, another native hedge with the neighbors instead of that privet hedge along the border. Um, and then this existing meadow, um, letting that expand into what was a, a larger vegetable garden. Um, you can also add, do some composting in your backyard if you have space for it, um, just you know to keep your food waste from going to landfills. Um, and then this, I didn't really talk about this, but um, on the in the woods on the edge, there's um, there's some good native trees like ash, oak, hawthorn, and some wild grapes. Um, but there's also some invasives like Norway maple, invasive the invasive shrub honeysuckles, and um, European buckthorn and multiflora rose. Um, so those are sort of things you're gonna try to manage on the edge of your properties um, where you can, and then just to be aware that those are the likely weeds that you're going to get coming in. Um, so just to keep an eye out for those. Um, yeah, so I also in this in the on the north end of the site planted um, a lot of trees, to, native trees to sort of, um, you know, connect to the woods and also hopefully to eventually add some native seeds to the seed bank in the woods too. Um, yeah. um, oh, and these purple are vines. Um, I planted on this Norway maple snag by the driveway. Um, uh, I planted a um, uh, Linnister sempervirens, um, the trumpet honeysuckle vine, which is a really pretty, I have some pictures coming up, um, a really pretty native vine. Um, and there was some existing Virginia creeper over in this area of the woods. Um, and then I also, I added some more trumpet honeysuckle. Um, there's a fence along this back part of the property. Um, yep, so I added some of that along the, uh, along the fence in the back. Um, so hedgerows and shrublands, um, they're important habitat and food for birds. Um, that's not that common in New York. Um, just because people normally, um, you know, there's a lot of lawn and there's a lot of woods, but there's not a whole lot of in-between landscapes. Um, yeah, cool. so it's good to plant shrubs. Um, and native shrubs, they have a big range in height um, from, you know, low bush blueberry that's a couple feet tall um, to 15 to 20 foot tall. Um, Shrubs like button bush and staghorn sumac. Um, so just think about what, um, you know, know the mature height of what you're planting so that you, um, 
you know, know what, get or putting something in that's the right size for what you want. And there are a lot of native, uh, there are a lot of edible native shrubs like blueberries, high bush cran cranberry, uh, black chokeberry, hazelnuts, elderberry, sagarin humic, red mulberry, and uh, the service berry or juneberry. Um, and the shrubs are, uh, they're really important um, since they're sort of a lower height and more dense than some of the other um, plants, um, some of the other layers. They're really important for shaping outdoor rooms um, to create different feelings from the height and density of the shrubs, um, you know, how far you can see. Um, so they're important for that. Um, some are dioecious, which uh, means they have uh, male and female flowers on different plants. So you have to plant enough of those um, so that they can pollinate, so that they can get pollinated and you'll actually get fruit um, for the birds and possibly uh, people, <laughs> they're edible. But, um, so shrublands uh, will start out like a meadow unless you have existing shrubs. Um, and then just, you know, thinking about natural succession, um, shrubs and trees will grow in um, to any meadow if you don't cut it. Um, you just have to, you can just, um, so you can let things grow and then select the um, desirable plants, the desirable natives that come in and choose to keep those and remove um, invasives and plants that weren't in a good place. Um, so if you have clonal shrubs like this red plug dogwood, um, and there's some silky dogwood in here too, um, that's taller, um, you can just, you can let those spread where you would like them to go and uh, you can keep them in check by mowing, um, uh, mowing around the edges. And, um, and a spice bush is a good native shrub. Oops. That, um, that deer don't usually eat that much. So that's a good, um, you know, a good one to know. <laughs> um, so for a native hedgerow, um, there's, um, oh, this, this is red twig dog with flowers are very pretty also. Um, so for a hedgerow, you can, um, for the spacing, you can make the plant space them a little tightly. Um, you know, tighter than their mature size, um, just so that they'll fill in um, more and be more of a view barrier. Um, and it's easier to clean, if you plant um, pumping shrubs, it's easier to keep them in a line rather than the clonal shrubs um, that'll keep wanting to spread sideways. Um, so you want, for a hedgerow, it's great. Um, if you can plant height shrubs that grow to the height that you ultimately want them to be, then you won't have to do any pruning, which um, is, much nicer than a lot of um, non-native hedgerows that you have to prune pretty frequently. <laughs> so there are some shrubs too that can be cut back every few years like native spireas, um, which are good for more disturbed areas like parking lots, um, you know, where just, uh, where the snow plows can really kind of um, sort of mess them up in the winter. You can just cut them back and they'll grow up um, and they'll grow up back up and be fine. It's um, good for some places. If you're, yeah, if you're planting clonal shrubs, you can keep them where you want by mowing along the edges. Um, just if you're doing this like along like a property line with a neighbor, just maybe think about, um, you know, if that's a good place for it, if, um, you know, it's going to create uh, issues. <laughs> um, so it's good to think about. Um, and I think hedgerows, you know, can include small trees too. Um, this picture in the bottom right corner is hawthorn growing sort of on the edge of the woods. Um, which is a nice native shrub. Um, it does have, or native small tree. It does have pretty big thorns. Um, so not, you know, not everywhere is a good place for it, but um, certainly uh, there are a lot of good places for it though. Um, it's just some more red twig dogwood in winter has that great, um, you know, red bark color. Um, and this is a chokeberry, um, black chokeberry shrub. Um, this is fenced uh, while it's young to protect it from deer, just so that it can kind of get established and get going. Um, and then this is an elderberry shrub that actually just, um, I think, uh, you know, just started growing in our yard it was a, as a volunteer plant and was not planted. So, um, yeah, so it's good to keep an eye out and see what good stuff or bad stuff could be coming in. Um, Um, so it's, you want to try to work in native vines where you can. Um, they sort of, 
you know, you can have some vines and meadows and um, shrubs and on trees, obviously. So they sort of just um, work into all the other um, landscape layers. And if you have a layer, um, an arbor or a trellis, you want to grow them up too, that would be good. Um, so this is that trumpet honeysuckle, which is really a beautiful native vine. Um, so this one, it kind of needs um, sort of like a trial, not, um, it's not going to grow up like just a big tree trunk because it, um, so something like that's, um, because it grows wrapping around things. So it doesn't, um, it's not going to just grow up a tree like a grapevine will. Um, so it's good if you have some sort of uh, like trellis or something smaller with, uh, you know, that's smaller around that you that it can grow up is good for it. Um, and hummingbirds really like it. So it's a great, um, it's a great plant for that too. Um, and this is uh, some Virginia creeper is the red in this picture, um, growing up some trees and shrubs. Um, and this one, it's not super aggressive. So it's not gonna like bring down trees like grapevine can um, or oriental bittersweet. Um, and it's easy to tell apart from poison ivy because it has five leaflets instead of three. Um, at least from up close. <laughs> um, and then trumpet vine is a native vine um, that's very that's also very aggressive, uh, or that's very aggressive. So you want to um, you know be careful not to you want to be careful where you plant it to make sure uh, that it can support it can take the weight of it eventually. Um, it's going to make a lot of seedlings too, so you'll you'll have a lot of it once you plant it. Um, but yeah, this is the uh, this is the stem of it, so it, it can get pretty sizable. Um, and wild grape is also, at least um, some of them are native vines, um, and they're, they're also very aggressive, and they can um, they can smother trees. So um, you know, sometimes it's uh, it's good to leave them where you can, but you can cut them back off trees every few years so that they are not going to kill the tree, um, but you still get some benefits to wildlife. Um, oh, um, clematis virginiana is um, a, another really nice native vine with white flowers. Um, there are some invasive hybrids, um, like I think the sweet autumn is a non-native um, non cultivar. So like don't definitely don't buy those. Make sure you're buying the native one, um, but that's a really nice native vine. Uh, so the forest garden, um, how and what you plant is the most dependent uh, in this one. This one is the one where it's most dependent on what your current successional stage of the landscape is. Um, you know, if you have a meadow versus if you have existing large trees, it's, you're going to plant it really differently. Um, so yeah, just think about that. Um, and uh, you can plant um, trees and shrubs that will eventually grow in a forest. But if you are starting a forest garden, you can plant the trees and shrubs that you want there eventually, as long as they're sun tolerant. Um, even if you're starting with a meadow. So you can just, you know, basically start with a meadow and have some trees um, mixed into it that won't really be noticeable for, you know, the first, um, you know, several years that you have it, but will it'll eventually grow up into forest. Um, it's called sort of initial floristic composition. Um, so you want to, um, so you're basically picking a trajectory for the landscape when you do that, um, which uh, this is, Larry Weiner talks about this a lot in his book, um, Garden Revolution, which is very good if you want to, um, you know, read more about this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, and so you can't plant shade plants, especially like woodland understory plants until the shade is actually there. Um, you know, a lot of them are really uh, shade dependent and will will just uh, die out if there's too much sun. Um, so you want to wait until there's, um, until the trees are more mature for that, um, unless you have existing trees, of course. Um, you can face trees and shrubs closer than their mature width, um, you know, sort of like they grow in the woods. Um, especially um, if you're planting a large, like a sugar maple that'll grow up into a large tree next to a flowering dogwood, um, they can be relatively, they can be pretty close um, because they're not going to be, the flowering dogwood is going to stay short and the you know, so their roots and the leaves aren't going to be in the exact same place, so they won't really, they'll be cooperating more than competing. Um, and in a forest garden, you can have all the other habitat layers too here. Um, you know, you'll have the ground layer and perennials and uh, shrubs and vines and small trees in here also. Um, you're just um, deciding which of the layers you want and where to shape spaces and paths and views um, in this type of garden. Um, and I, I just like this quote, uh, only a forest can grow a forest. Um, 
I think it's uh, very true. But um, so this is kind of just a ground cover under some existing trees with some wild strawberry and sunflower and may apple. Um, so you can plant these things uh, right away if you have shade. Um, this is sort of another how it starts out. Um, you know, pretty small under existing trees. Um, you know, just planting some natives along the edge that you'll eventually expand. Um, um, and this is the flowering dogwood, um, which obviously in the woods, uh, they'll grow with a more open habit um, than they will in full sunlight like this one has. Um, but it's just a great native uh, small tree. Um, and this is sort of, you know, the, um, the wild forest is sort of the model for, you know, what we're trying to get this to look like eventually. <laughs> Um, and just a reminder sort of to protect your trees. Um, don't do mulch volcano, um, do mulch donuts, not mulch volcanoes. Um, and then, you know, don't drive over or park on your tr on tree roots and don't cut into tree roots or scrape the trunk of the bar, uh, tr the trunk of the tree. Um, protect young, you want to protect young trees from deer brows with fencing or organic repellent. Um, like this is a, um, a small sugar maple that I sense um, our yard gets a lot of deer pressure. So, um, yeah, so this is a six foot fence. Um, this is a, kind of a sad before and after picture, but this is uh, when the, the tree got about seven feet tall, I took it out of the fence. And um, like the same day, the deer came and ate every, ate every leaf under five feet. <laughs> so, um, which the tree was okay because it was tall enough. Um, but, you know, this is just. Um, yeah, so you have to fence things until they can take the deer. Um, at least I found, or fence or use a repellent. But um, so you also want to um, plant trees at the right height. Um, you want to make sure that the um, you know the root flare is at the top of the soil. Sometimes in nurseries, um, when things get repotted, they just end up the soil ends up too high on the trunk of the tree. So you want to make sure that's right when you plant it, um, and also that they don't have girdling roots. Um, you know, a root like wrapped around the trunk because um, eventually when the tree matures, it'll get wider and then it'll, um, you know, it'll choke itself basically with the root. Um, so you want to make sure that's not there when you plant it. Um, that's really common. A lot of Norway maples you'll see were planted like that. Um, anyway, but uh, not that Norway maples are good, but just they have a, tend to have a lot of growing roots. Um, uh, so also for ash trees, you know, the emerald ash borers, um, in the area. So if there's any ash trees that you want to keep, especially in your buildings um, or specific ones, it's good to start treating those, um, uh, you know, for the emerald ash borer. Um, and really, there's not many times I would suggest using a synthetic pesticide or, um, you know, synthetic pesticide, but I think this is one of the exceptions of a good time, um, you know, when you're, you know, going to lo possibly lose an entire genus of trees. It's, um, you know, I think a good exception. Um, here's, um, you know, just some tree. This is some pictures of ash trees, um, you know, that were healthy a few years ago and are now pretty much dead from the emerald ash borer. Um, and this is a picture of, you know, a path through the woods, um, you know, on a trail where there's the ash trees are mostly dead on this side. So it should be shady in here, um, you know, in the middle of summer, but it's pretty sunny. Um, anyway, it's just that's a um, in the area, but. Oh, you also, if you have, um, you know, if you have more land, a larger land, especially, um, you'll want to keep an eye out to see if there's any um, wild ash trees in your area that um, that are look like they're resistant to emerald ash borer. Sort of once this wave has gone through, um, I think there's not like a really, you know, it's the problem. It's not like likely, but I'm not sure if they found any yet or many yet that are resistant. Um, so it's um, but yeah, it's good to keep an eye out in case um, in case there happens to be a population that's more resistant. But just a little bit more on the forest garden. Um, if you're starting with existing trees, it's really important to not disturb the tree roots um, while you're planting and doing work around them. Um, you want to minimize the disturbance around the roots. Um, you can plant seeds or smaller plants or plugs in that area just so you're digging it up less. Um, and if you're planting in an area and find a large root, um, just cover it back up and move, you know, to the side a little bit so you're not going to be um, messing that up. Um, and you can allow natural regeneration where you can, um, just basically letting native volunteer trees 
or native volunteers uh, plant that are in good places and you know that are a good species. Um, well, pretty much any native would be a good species, but um, well, depending on your needs. But uh, you know, make sure you're not letting invasives grow in. Um, yep, so that's important to do. Um, you know, because it's local ecotype. Um, wild plants are always good to have where where that's going to happen. Um, you need to be close to a seed source for that to work. So it might not. You know, it's not going to work in every um, in every yard. That might not happen as much. Um, and the forest gardens, they're you're getting the most biomass for your effort um, and also to support biodiversity and also to absorb carbon. Um, you know, to mitigate climate change is important. Um, and they also help create a cooler microclimate, which can be a great, um, you know, a great thing for shading your house on the east and west sides in summer um, and for, you know, just making comfortable your yard a more comfortable place in the summer too. Um, and this is actually, this is a picture on the, um, the Albany County Rail Trail. There's um, some existing woods, um, you know, that have a great woodland understory with ferns and some, and may apple. Um, there's also, unfortunately, in this area, there's some uh, garlic mustard and oriental bittersweet growing in. Um, but yes, yeah, so obviously that would be better if that were removed <laughs> at some point to keep this area good. But um, this is sort of what it looks like. Um, it's very nice. And this is sort of if you plant, um, uh, you know, when you're planting under existing trees, it could start out looking like this, um, you know, keeping the, um, the mulch away from the trunk of the tree and kind of planting a, uh, smaller things out, um, you know, so you're not right next to the um, root, the largest roots is good. Um, and then this is, this is under crab apple, so they're, um, you know, their leaf, uh, their shade's not really dense, so it's sort of a sunnier, shady area. <laughs> um, and this is in the afternoon, so it's more light than it normally gets. Um, yep, so it starts like this, and then in a few years, it can grow up and look like this. With um, This is in the fall with lots of different, three different asters and goldenrod, and um, it's really, uh, pollinators really love it, too. Um, so that's nice. Um, and this is just a couple, um, wild strawberry is a really common, and um, Wild strawberry and this is yellow wood sorrel are both pretty common um, little native volunteer plants that are great, um, especially early. Um, the wood sorrel is an annual, so that'll grow, um, you know, when you're first starting your garden. Um, so it's a good one to keep. And the wild strawberry is a little um, uh, sort of a little trailing plant, you know, with stolons that um, is also very good to keep in your yard. Um, just to keep an eye out for it. Um, it has little edible fruits too, um, if you can beat <laughs> the wildlife to, a, to them. <laughs> so this is kind of just one uh, sort of the mature garden plan of what it'll look like someday, hopefully. Um, you know, the, lar the trees that were planted have uh, grown to pretty close to their mature size. So there's a lot more shade um, in more areas. Um, and you also want to, um, Want to keep some areas of meadow that are sunny is good to have. Um, again, depending on your yard size, um, and I have left a, a mouse strip here along the road um, just so that it's, uh, you know, clearly uh, cared for for people that are passing. You know, that's used to care. Um, yeah, and then it's good. Uh, yeah, it's good to keep some. Like, try to keep each of the, you know, keep some meadow and some shrubland and some trees. To have a mix in your landscape is good. Um, and the wetland garden over here is expanded. Um, I turned the black, the one black gum tree into a little grove. Um, there's a little little grove of service berry trees here too. Um, yep. So I think. Um, oh, and if you have, um, you know, you can have some more sort of formal or um, edible gardens um, closer to the house too. Um, you know, so that you're growing food is also. Is also a good use, um, and you know, having that compost in the back. Um, and there's a little bit. This is mostly meadow back here, but um, there's also some three sisters, uh, or you know, a three sisters um, and a raised bed for vegetables, um, or a three sisters garden back here. <laughs> um, and you know, if you have, if you're able to, and have a good south facing roof to add some solar panels, is good to do too. Um, but, um, so just kind of to step back a little bit. Um, and uh, <laughs> look at the bigger picture, um, or you know, remember the bigger picture. Um, you know, we're in a pretty serious uh, biodiversity and climate change um, crises now. But um, you know, the UN 
uh, so kind of just looking at the goals of, um, yeah, of, for these two pretty big issues. Um, the UN Biodiversity Conference last year, um, they recommended that the world try, that we try to conserve 30% of the world's land, coastal areas and oceans. Um, currently 17% of the land and 8% of marine areas are protected. Um, so there's a ways to go there. Um, and also E.O. Wilson in his book that came out a few years ago, um, you know, suggested setting half the side, half the world aside for um, con conservation. Um, but you know, more um, uh, a, you know, a larger goal. But um, still, uh, anyway. But you know, we can do our little part in our yards. Um, and then for climate change, um, you know, the global temperature has already risen one point about 1.1 degrees, um, and to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And you know, that's the worst of the impacts. Um, we need to be carbon neutral by 2050 um, and have emissions peak by 2025 um, and decline 43% by 2030. Um, so that's another pretty steep goal, um, but it was just sort of that. Um, so just our parts, how our, you know, our landscapes can solve, um, be a part of solving these problems. Um, you know, at home in our own yards, we can obviously uh, start doing, you know, start doing what we can for biodiversity and to absorb carbon. Um, and to re reduce our energy use. Um, and also in local parks, oops, um, schools and neighborhoods, we can also do this, um, especially if you're in an apartment and don't have a yard, um, there's still a lot you can do. Um, so we can turn our landscapes into beautiful, living, edible landscapes that absorb um, and store carbon from the atmosphere. Um, we also, you know, by growing like this, you also are building healthy soil, reducing energy use, supporting biodiversity, uh, slowing, cleaning, and infiltrating stormwater, uh, reconnecting habitat fragments, um, recycling nutrients naturally on the site, uh, growing delicious, nutritious, and local food, um, and enjoying watching plants and wildlife grow. Um, so just kind of in closing, um, here's a quote from Robin Kimmerer um, from her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, um, that I would definitely recommend everyone read. <laughs> um, Action on behalf of life transform transforms. Because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal, it is not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do have some reference slides um, that I can I can share by email too, if um, or just have up while we're answering questions. Also. Okay, well, I thought what we could do for our question and answer session is if people would like to keep this a little bit more informal, um, if you could just raise your hand, and then we can just go through and uh, just let everybody speak up. Let me know how you think that might work. Okay, so Jennifer, I see you. Would you, do you have a comment? Yes, hi. Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm... I'm planting some things for the town as well as for myself. I'm still kind of new. When you say don't, you can't plant shade plants under a small tree, I understand that, but can I plant like part sun, part shade plants and maybe move them in five years? Because I still want to have a garden while they're growing in. I'm not quite sure how to handle that. Yeah, I mean, uh, sorry, just for a small tree, um, I meant just, uh, you know, like a, like a trillium or something that really needs like the deep woods of deep shade of woods. Um, you can't plant those, but there are a lot of plants that are, um, you know, that can tolerate shade to like part sun. So those you can definitely plant. Um, okay. <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, let me just look through here and see who else has, if anybody else has their hand up. Okay. And it looked like uh, there were a couple of comments in the um, meeting chat about uh, Creeping Charlie when you were talking about the lawns and some of the invasives. Um, you specifically suggested stilt grass, but a couple of comments came in. Um, one is about Creeping Charlie and another is about Lesser Leandine. Can you speak to those? Yeah, yeah. Well, the creeping Charlie. Yep, I know what you mean by that one. I'm not sure what the second one is, um, but uh, yep. So I think that's um, uh, yeah. So that I'm not. I think there's. If I'm getting the common name right, um, 
you know, it's definitely a problem in lawn. And uh, I think that does, you know, get into beds and you have to keep trying to weed it out. Um, but I just mean, like, it's not going to overtake a natural, healthy forest, you know, um, or, uh, you know, or shrubs or, or a meadow that's, um, so it's like, it's definitely a weed problem, but it's not, um, you know, it's not like Japanese knotweed that's just going to come in and like destroy everything. But <laughs> anyway, if that helps. <laughs> Anybody else have any comments or questions? We did have a question come in. I guess there's a question and answer feature now in Zoom. So if you don't mind, I'll read those ones off for us. Oh. Um, so I'm not sure who, who sent this one in. It just says iPad number two. It says, how about planting pawpaw trees? Yeah, yeah, those are a great native tree um, with yeah, big edible fruits. Um, I think those are even tolerant of black walnut, but... Um, but yeah, they're they're a great native tree. Yeah. yeah, I tried planting two last year, and unfortunately, I think during our heat wave, they did not do well. And mm -hmm. I will admit, I was not diligent about getting out there and watering because we all know how important it is to water until they're established. But that's what I get for trying to garden with a toddler. I've been told that numerous times. So, but yeah, I like pawpaws. I'm kind of sad that they're not working out. I think the hardest part is getting a hold of them personally. I had a hard time sourcing. Yeah, them. those are they they can yeah, they can be kind of hard to find at nurseries. Um I think too you might need um like quite a few of them to pollinate too, but Oh, to yeah, that is true. Eventually, but yeah. Um and then oh, another Laura uh asked a question about May apple. She's not tried it before. Where can I buy it and would it grow well in a primarily pine forest? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it's going to grow very well under pine trees. Um, there aren't, you know, as many, um, you know, there's kind of less things that grow under those. Um, you could always get, get, just get a couple and try it and see how it goes. Um, you know, if it doesn't work, then don't get more. Um, you should be able, there are, I think, you usually can find it at not every native nursery, but um, ones that have more woodland plants, you'll probably find it. Um, I think I have a list of um, native nurseries that, oh, I think I must have taken them off for this talk. Um, but um, I think we do, I think there is a list that, um, I don't know, we can share by email if that, um, you know, Yeah, I know we have one on our chapter website, but it's only like oh, yeah, regional. Yeah. yeah. And then I know wild yeah, ones yeah. might even have a bigger one as well. So mm -hmm. let okay. me see if I can. Oh, yeah. yeah actually, it's in that. You know, sorry. I shared sorry, the link yeah, early. Early native nurseries in your area. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all right. I just realized I shared the link earlier because you were talking about wild ones, the program that they have with the. Uh, Native garden design on stuff, that yeah. website, mm -hmm. they do have a much larger list um, of just nature gardens, nurseries that all have native plants in which I keep forgetting that this was kind of promoted a little bit wider than our capital region area. So <laughs> I want to make sure that if anybody's visiting from maybe Pennsylvania, we had somebody from Canada too. So who knows? <laughs> The widespread. And those were the two questions that came in through Q. Oh, wait, hang on. Let me double check. It looks like another one popped up. Oh, oh, so Laura actually had a follow up question about the May apples. Is there anything that does grow well underneath pines? It's a tricky question. Um, yeah. uh, I'm not really sure. Um, just off the top of my head, I, I don't really know of that many. Um, you can look up, um, at least if you're in, in New York State, there's, um, you can you can Google this to find it, but there's uh, a New York State um, a plant, I think New York State Ecological Communities. Um, uh, it's, it's got like, it's basically like a big list of all the native plant communities in New York State, and it lists, um, you know, some of the, you know, the plants that grow in that plant community. So that, that would probably have some. Um, sorry, hopefully that helps. <laughs> Ooh, I think everybody's figuring out how to use the Q&A. This is my first time using it too, so this is pretty cool. Um, oh, and then one more from Heather. She has a question about her yard that is clay soil and does not drain. So it's very, very wet in spring. 
but it can be dry and hard for most of July, August, and September. Is there any wetland plants that will still survive? This sounds like my yard too, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> or any good recommendations you can think of? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. Actually, um, you know, my yard at home also is heavy clay soil. So it's, yeah, it's a tough one. <laughs> but um, yeah, actually a lot of those wetland pictures were from uh, were from my yard. So they, um, you know, sneeze weed will do well. Um, New England Aster, um, early goldenrod is, um, a nice goldenrod that's not as aggressive as Canada goldenrod. Um, I think the lobelias will do well, the red cardinal flower and the um, blue lobelia. Um, uh, marsh marigold is a nice spring ephemeral that'll grow in wet soils. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a nice one. Um, you know, the swamp milkweed that'll grow. Um, i trying to think. Um, a turtle head, that's a nice one too. Um, I usually use the white turtle head, but um, Anyway, but um, yeah, and I think that Virginia mountain mint that'll that should grow there too. But oh, and the uh, common milkweed too, obviously. So. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> I <laughs> think that's it from the questions in the Q and A. And I didn't see anything else in the chat. I know Rosemary looked through there too. Well then. All right, well, shall we wrap it up then? Does anybody have anything else? Any final comments? Well, wonderful. Thank you for attending. All right.